So this is obviously, we're talking this morning about the skills pipeline. I think that's the important thing to say. Um, top of my list of notes is the fact that one thing I've already forgotten is to say, who on earth am I? Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Mike Hughes. I'm the business editor of the Northern Echo. And we're working with the combined authority today. Um, during National Apprenticeship Week, it's vital that we get the right sort of pipeline in place, as we've been discussing earlier on, that young people realize the opportunities, realize what businesses are available here, what career options are available here. So we're going to talk to our panel, I'll get them to introduce themselves in a second, um, about those opportunities, how they regard apprenticeships, why they're important, how they fit into the other options that there are, and why it's vital as we look at the wall there about all the sort of progress that's been made here, crazy amount of work going on. We're going to need people with brand new skills that we've never heard of before, with the right sort of attitudes and the opportunity to say, right, if I'm going to be finishing my course at a certain time, if I'm a certain age, what's going to be available for me? What are these marvelous new companies of circular fuels and SEER and BP, what the work that they're doing here, when can I work with them? It all sounds great. The picture is being painted for them. How do they actually get that work? That's why it's really important. So we shall run along our panel. Um, at any time during this, including when I'm talking, when they are, if you have any questions, if you want to make a particular point, just raise your hands and I'll try and I'll sort of catch your eye and we'll have that sort of conversation. So I'm going to ask my panel to very briefly introduce themselves, um, what the business they are from, and then we'll have a conversation. Jo, should we start Hello. with you? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jo Burgess, and I'm the Director of Apprenticeships at Teesside University, and, it, and it's great to be here today. Thanks, Mike. Greg. Uh, Greg Chapman from Upper Bridge Family, and I am the Academy Manager looking after all the apprentices and trainings. Excellent. Grant. Morning everybody, I'm Grant Glendinning. I'm the Chief Exec at the Education Training Collective, which is a group of uh, colleges across Teesside um, in uh, Stockton, Billingham and uh, Redka. And Carl. Morning everybody, my name's Carl Penderton. I'm the Managing Director at Active Charter Financial Planners. And up until recently, I was also the Chair for the Institute of Directors for this area. And Sharon. Morning everyone, I'm Sharon Lane, I'm MD at Tees Components, uh, I'm also a Governor at Middlesbrough College and I chair the North East Advisory Board for Make UK, the manufacturers organisation. And you get your own private microphone as well, <laughs> that's great, that's a special, uh, a special treat for you. Um, Joe, let's go to the, uh, to the university, so you head up the, the higher and degree apprenticeships sort of operation there. Um, what are the particular sort of challenges, I suppose, the, the barriers if businesses want to get involved in that? Is it, a, is it an easy route, a straightforward route? Is there still work to be done? Um, uh, from, it, from a university perspective, we're, we've been thinking an awful lot about this, about how we better connect businesses with the opportunities if you like. Um, so part of our work, I'm, I'm relatively new, Mike, to, to mm. the region and to the university um, sort of joining six or seven months ago. So there's been a big piece of work to do around our strategic mission, our vision around higher and degree apprenticeships. So there's been a big piece of work going on there. Um, and part of this is looking at how we connect the skills ecosystem to deliver the skills that industry needs. And I think we, we need to do better on that front, connecting with our regional skills partners to, to, provide, to provide the skills solutions. Because what we hear an awful lot from employers is that they, they really like the idea of apprenticeships and two of our customers are on the panel today. Um, but actually finding the talent or encouraging the talent or, or, or securing people that are interested in delivering and wanting to do apprenticeships is a big piece. I think the other thing about certainly from Teesside's perspective and certainly what we're talking at ministerial level is about how we differentiate our offer in order that we're not we're, 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 we're delivering what the industry needs and 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 kind of avoiding that comp not competition if you like but we're very much around um, complementing provision in the region I think is a big piece. So part of the, the strategic work that we're doing is really looking at what Teesside University is about in terms of our research capability and how we're really 
really fueling our apprenticeships through our research capability and our links with industry in order to deliver <coughs> the skills need. So what does that mean in purpose? It means we're looking at our provision, we're looking at the programs that we're developing and looking at where we can really deliver what industry needs. So looking at things like AI and data science is a key area of what we're trying to do. Looking at our engineering offer, how we're delivering through um, our, net ze the, the, our net zero ambitions. So there's a real kind of future focus to the work that we're doing at Teesside. But I think as a, a sort of breaking down that barriers, it is about supporting businesses to understand how hiring degree apprenticeships can work and can work within their business. Mm. And that's a big part of what we're doing at the moment within the university. And therefore a huge opportunity still out there. Is the growth I of mean, those opportunities is enormous. We, we are one of the lowest um, regions, if you like, nationally around the uptake of hiring degree level apprenticeships. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Glenn? Mm -hmm. We have a, got a big piece of work to do around raising awareness and supporting businesses. And tomorrow, Teesside University, we launch our higher and degree level apprenticeship employers forum, where we're really looking to get down to that granular detail of what is happening with employers and businesses and how can we help them. And what, obviously, one thing we hope with events like this is it just raises that awareness, gives that little bit of extra information Absolutely. to help people take that next step. Um, we're not far off the perfect panel here, I would imagine. Greg from uh, at Applebridge. Um, recently named fourth in the country, uh, it was, as, as the top SME employer for apprentices. I mean, that's worth having a little conversation about in itself. What, how do you get to that sort of a level? Obviously, just to start and take on apprentices is one thing. Mm. How do you get to that? What, what's the sort of secret of that particular level of success? First of all, yes, it's, it's, it is a great achievement, but you've got to have that investment and, and, and back and buy your, your, your senior management team and your directors of the company. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for them, um, then we wouldn't have a platform to to work with. It's it, it is difficult bringing in lots of apprentices, but like you say, another key success to that is the the, the mentors that look after our apprentices. Uh, you need these key people out on site because they will be giving up their time when they should be working and being product product uh, productive to, yeah. to give them give their experience and knowledge to to that new apprentice. So it's all it's all about building that right platform to to employ and give them a chance to, to develop their so, the new skills. So, so that's a matter of, as you say, suggest of passing down the enthusiasm for what apprentices can do for the business, yes. right down through yeah. through every level, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's no good just taking apprentices on just to, just, to, just to fill a job role. And you have to, you have to, a company has to put that time and effort in to to train and develop that person and to, to, to build them to what to what they want you know, to, to fit within the business needs. Um, and, that, and that's the way I look at it. And like I say, we've got a aging workforce and with, with within every sector. So it's it's we feel it's Apple Bridge's responsibility to to bring that new people to bring new people with, in within the business. Yeah. I mean to not to fly the flag too much for us, but we're at the Northern Acre we're the same sort of thing because we've got been in business a long time. I've been in business more than 40 odd years doing this sort of job. And yeah, I'm working with Charlotte here from Durham University, I'm mentoring Charlotte, just to bring her into that industry and say, yeah. this is what it is like mm -hmm. now. You may have a certain idea of what it's like, but this is what this is what I do sort of day in, day out. Mm -hmm. And it may well frighten the living daylights out, which they will, that's <laughs> not for me. But giving them that insight, yeah. that's what the important thing is. 100%, 100%. Have the choices as well. 100%. Granted, we're just, again, looking back at that wall of amazing sort of progress that we're, we're now we're in a net zero sort of age now. And as we were suggesting before, that the types of work that some apprentices might be doing is changing it all. Mm -hmm. How do you think we're doing with it, or ETC is doing with that, providing the skills for that sort of new, the net zero age? Is that coming along well? It, it, it is, Mike, and it, it's, it's really exciting, isn't it, that this time and this location, really. I mean, we, we're sitting right next door to mm -hmm. somewhere that's described as a net zero hotspot, mm -hmm. a, a hydrogen super place, you know, t Tease Works. And we really hope that that will transpire. And uh, we're certainly gearing up for that um, and for those opportunities within the ETC. Um, as I said before, we're a group of colleges and our nearest college to, to the Teesworks site is Redcar and Cleveland College, just a couple of miles uh, down the road. 
Um, and in April um, this year, we're opening our um, clean energy education hub, um, which has been specifically uh, planned for um, with an eye on uh, the future opportunities that, that Teesworks will bring to, to local residents in Teesside and, and Redka. Um, and that site, um, apprenticeships will be absolutely pivotal to the development of that site. Um, we're excited about our new um, carbon capture rig that, that's just being installed there. Um, but we're also um, planning hydrogen um, programs, training programs, uh, alongside um, more kind of micro energy uh, production, such as PV, solar panel installation, um, air source, ground source heat pumps. Um, and we're developing a retrofit um, curriculum to go alongside that as well. So we're talking with um, our housing group partners to see what, what their strategy is going to be into the future uh, to decarbonize their, their very large estates that, mm. that need to be um, worked on. So, I mean, it, it, apprenticeships are really exciting within that, um, along with, with a mix of other, other training programs as well. Um, we can't forget T-levels, which are the kind of new kid on the block uh, that, that, are, that are coming out and um, I hope that as apprenticeships change, as these programmes change, there'll be a real holistic choice um, for, for the inward investing employers that, that we'll see on Teesworks and some fantastic opportunities for, for young people and retraining adults. I suppose what you're saying and what I suppose every business here today will find is that you, you have to be agile yourself as it can't, because there's so many new businesses coming in, so many new sectors. You can't say, right, this is our offering, we've, we've finished, you know, help yourself. You have to change and you'd have to be maybe doing apprenticeships and work at stuff that you've never even thought about a year ago or two years ago. Absolutely. I think the, the new technologies um, and the new concepts and, and new ways to meet this requirement to transition um, from fossil fuels is going to require an entirely new uh, workforce with entirely new uh, sets of skills uh, that, that we've got to be looking ahead to and, and planning a, a, an appropriate curriculum for. Mm -hmm. there, there will always be a requirement for the fundamental skills w within you know, th those training programs sure. and all of the wider employability skills. Um, but, but we certainly can't stand still with, with the curriculum development. Yeah. So, You've got to keep moving absolutely. all the time. Uh, Carl, at Active, you're sort of reaping the benefits of of, of apprenticeships for sort of a good while, but sort of internally as well, there's progress to be made with sort of with your own teams as, as, as well as sort of of outside. I wanted to try and touch on the sort of the level of the support that you get, the so things like the Tees Valley Growth Fund program, that sort of thing. How, how would you sort of sum up that sort of support for someone like yourself that wants to develop its own company as well as with apprenticeships? I think the uh I think like most businesses, it's knowing where to turn to for that support. Mm. Um, you know, I, I would honestly say this time last year, I wouldn't have necessarily known what was available uh, and the breadth of what was available. And uh, one of my fellow directors, Paul Gibson, actually did quite a lot of research with uh, Lucy on the front row there. And it, it actually transpired that we have accessed funding and training literally from the top level all the way down through through every aspect of our business and uh, you know I, I, I had them written down 25 of our 30 uh, within our team have actually gone through some form of funded training from probably around September last year onwards so certainly the last six months mm. and uh, you know, they vary from the Skills for Growth program, Leading Growth, the Leadership MBA apprenticeship through Teesside University that I was talking uh, to Joe about, uh, the EMS Going for Growth program, brilliant Middlesbrough-based business, equity, uh, equality and diversity training, and again, all of our back office and support functions going through the culture of professional development. Uh, and that word there typifies how we try and look at it as a business. It's about the culture. It's about wanting to continuously self-develop. And we can teach knowledge in our industries and our businesses, can't we? The skills to do the, the, the job. But then it's the actual skills that go beneath the knowledge, which I think a lot of businesses forget about. And uh, again, trying to get the exact numbers uh, for, for today, we worked out 
and uh, and I'll round things up because I have a bit of OCD. But we worked out that <laughs> it's about fifty thousand pounds worth of training we've had since September. Yeah. If we'd have gone and paid for it all ourselves, and we've ended up paying, I would say we're lucky if we've ended up paying two, three thousand overall. And that, like, say that includes MBAs, that includes apprenticeships, that includes everything, GCSE level um, training for, for many people. So the funding is out there. It's getting on board with TVCA, actually speaking to them about the breadth of what skills do you need within your business, whether you're a director or a brand new starter, because the support and the training is actually out there. And the, you know, if the culture's right, then I would say embrace it whilst, whilst it's here. Just a really sort of simple point, whether you recall or not, but when you decided, right, we're going to get into this, who did you turn to? For, how did you decide to prepare? Did you just go to the local authority? Did you just ring someone up and say, I really want to develop some sort of program here. What can we do? What was your first port of call? I think we initially looked at it more just for one or two individuals uh, that had recently started within the business. Mm. And again, I believe it was more through a conversation with Lucy originally that we weren't aware of the breadth of support that was available. So it was making that initial contact, which we knew about through social media, email newsletters, etc., that come out through TBCA. So we knew who to go to for that initial course, but it was through that conversation, it, it developed and, and spiraled into something, actually, there could be an opportunity to upskill the whole workforce here. And mm. it's only, the only reason five people haven't done it is due to holidays, other exams they're already doing, <laughs> but to get, you know, nigh on 90% of your workforce through a training program within the last six months is quite, uh, is quite good going. Yeah. And, and, and the feedback from everybody who's mm. been on those courses is it, it really added value to their, their day job, which, um, you know, is, is fundamental to a business that's still passionate about growing. Yeah. The thing is that sort of funding is out there, yet a lot of businesses aren't going for it because they're just not aware of how do I do, what's the first step. It uh, just needs those two ends of that pipeline yeah. to me to think. Um, Sharon, apprentice trained yourself, is that right? Did you start out as an apprentice yeah. several years ago? A few years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I was lucky that I did an apprenticeship at TTE in the late oh, right, 90s. Yeah. Um, so, so, so when I did my apprenticeship, NBQs were just coming out. So it's kind of one of the first people to do the new competency qualifications and the new sort of modern apprenticeship, if you like, um, and then was able to go to university part time and things and, and get qualified. Yeah, there's mm. been a lot of changes since then. Yeah, that's what I was going to sort of touch on. It has presumably changed a lot. Is it keeping pace? Is it where it needs to be now, do you think? No, I mean, I, I don't think apprenticeships are working generally anywhere near as, as well as, as they should be and, and could be. I mean, we know that the numbers are down, don't we? we know that far fewer kids are able to get apprenticeships now than, um, than at that time. Um, and, you know, it, it's about perceptions for the young people themselves, their parents, and then the employers. So you've got three groups, really, that you know mm. all need to be on board with making apprenticeships work um young people do want apprenticeships they really do i mean we, we had some social media about this yesterday and I, I always get some people posting saying oh the problem is kids these days don't want to learn i just really strongly disagree with that um if we go you know if i could speak to kids at middlesbrough college speak to kids at grants colleges and you know they're all they've gone to to fe to carry on learning and the absolute prize for them is to be able to get an apprenticeship at the end of it. And it's it's what they all want to do pretty much um, that have gone to do vocational skills. Um, so I think the young people definitely still want to do it. The parents, you know, sometimes there can be a bit of negativity mm. about this route, but I feel like we're past that. I feel mm. like everybody right. understands that uni's not for everybody. Mm. Everybody understands that there are lots of opportunities in the Tees Valley with new industries, new sectors, and new technologies for, for those new skills. Um, and for the employers, you know, I think, unfortunately, there's nowhere near as much flexibility as there used to be in training. When I, again, when I did it in the 90s, um, you know, you could go to Longlands College, get um, your city and guild. And apart from that, your learning was all specific to the job that you were going to do. So you came out of your apprenticeship really, you know, able to hit the floor running. Whereas, you know, FE now, it, you know, it, it is restrained. It's inflexible. It has to deliver certain things. And I think for SMEs, it's, it's understanding that much as colleges would like to provide the absolute bespoke qualification for your apprentice, it's, it's not gonna happen. So it's about understanding that 
the apprenticeship is your base layer and then how else can you build the skills that you need for your people? How can you network with other businesses like yours and say, well, we all want our apprentices to do this training or this specific enrichment, let's all do it together or, you know, and I think it's that engagement with your local college, building those partnerships, particularly for SMEs, particularly for, you know, really small businesses where owner managers are worried about the risks of employing apprentices. We really need um, them to just try and build those partnerships with their local colleges to be able to make it successful, I think. Mm. Greg, a, a thought occurs as well when you're taking on these apprentices mm -hmm. and they get into the sort of level that, uh, that, that Applebridge are. It's not just a skill, it's a person thing as well, isn't it? Because you've got, you're playing a key role in developing a person yeah. that's going to come out at the other end with, A, with, with the skills, but with the ability to, to make them out. That's, I presume, is a conscious thing you're aware of that as, as they're passing through your organisation. That's a big responsibility, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's, it's hard to find that. Is there a perfect apprentice out there? But yeah. we've got to, to look at the... the, the it is a whole and, and, and try and recruit someone we think we can we can make fit within our business. Um, might not fit in with another construction company, but would fit in with our business. Um, and we, we work hard. We 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 recruit. It's it's tough recruiting at the moment. Um, it's it's quite to be fair. It's quite easy to recruit higher level apprentices, um, but recruiting that lower level apprentice because as a, as a construction company, we we don't just have one site. We we don't just go to, you don't just go to a factory. We've got a site uh, within 10 miles of each other, 20 miles, 30 miles down the road, and and, and, and it's, we haven't that struggle to to find that lower level one with it with it like the ground worker or the or the bricklayer who who who's come straight from school, who doesn't have a driving license, who who can't find that support to to get to a certain site, um, and re relies on us to, um, to 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 taxi him there, and sometimes we just can't do that. Um, mm. So I think we need we need a bit that employers need that extra support for bus passes and stuff like that. I know that mm -hmm. I know there's wheels to work, but yeah. not everyone's confident enough to jump on a scooter. Um, yeah, sure. But just that extra support from local authorities to, to especially for the first six months of a, of, a of, of someone's journey in their apprentice, just to just to support them with 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 that. Yeah, Carl, I'm interested in the. Uh where it is in your list of priorities, I suppose, because there'll be a lot of businesses here that are thinking, I'm, I'm just so busy, I've got to fulfil all these sort of contracts. The idea of having to take on someone, mentor them and sort of bring them through. But if, they, if we get the idea of this bigger picture, it's really, it's got to be a high priority, not just something you sort of add on when you've got time. Yeah, 100%. Um, we're unlike... So we're very much like, sorry, um, every other business out there in terms of recruitment has been a challenge over the last few years. Um, we do a, a survey amongst business leaders in this area and again, 10 of the replies from the Christmas, the, the end of year survey, 10 replies specifically said staff shortages, recruitment, productivity, retention, etc., has been the main challenge right now and moving forward. We're exactly the same. As a business, and again, I was talking to Sharon before we started, productivity is is an issue right now. I think we're all experiencing it for one reason or another. And yes, we could go and recruit more people to do the job, but ultimately we can't find those people. So we have to teach our people how to be better at doing their job so mm -hmm. they can potentially fulfill more and be more productive. Mm -hmm. um, so last year, it was our core focus was around skills and developing those people to actually be more productive um, mm. if we can't find the people externally. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it is hard, but as I said uh, a few minutes ago, we are reaping the rewards from that now. And I, I would say people feel a lot more comfortable in the roles they're doing within our business. They are uh, far more confident in the roles. And, you know, if, if that increases productivity, that you know that ultimately helps our business uh, without us going down the old style route which was trying to look for more people more people more people mm. um, it's not the perfect answer but it's it, it's a solution for the challenge that we're facing at the yeah. moment Sharon just hop back to you again for that sort of hot potato of a question about the male female split it's a, maybe the perfect person to ask that do you find that the apprenticeships and training is helping more women 
young girls sort of find jobs in that sort of a business or is, it, is that still a challenge? Is it, is it is apprenticeships a way to sort of try and balance that out? Or am I over, is it not much of a problem now? You know, I think, I think in a way, I hadn't really thought about it, but I suppose the skills shortage is kind of an incentive for employers to think more about diversity. So I suppose it is perhaps an opportunity for them to put more effort into making sure that they're reaching, you know, everybody in our in our demographic that they can. Mm. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on our recruitment processes um, with neurodiversity and trying to make sure that um, any kids with um, neurodiversities aren't disadvantaged in any way in terms of the way that we recruit, the way that we interview, go through assessment days and and those sorts of things. So I suppose these are really chances for all of us to reflect and think, are we definitely uh, recruiting and advertising what we're doing in a way that's accessible to everybody in all, in all parts of society? Um, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about getting those over 50s, who are mostly men who left the um, economic activity in the last few years about how to attract them back into work, you know, tax breaks and pensions and things mm -hmm. like that. And it did occur to me that the employers who are most likely to be able to do that are the ones who are already doing that for women returning to work after um, maternity leave and career breaks and things because they're already probably used to, you know, how to rebuild confidence again, sort of attract those people back in in a, you know, in a good way. Uh, whereas businesses who traditionally employed men and haven't had to do that really might find it a bit more tricky. As employers, we're all having to be really creative now, aren't we? Much more flexible and really just forget anything we've done in the past and just think where we are now in today's labor market, how can we really make sure that uh, we're, we're casting the net and leaving this open for everybody to to apply? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking that then you're all sort of running businesses or business organizations. It's not a simple thing. You can't just sort of set, turn up at the office and just do the job. No. So much stuff around it, but you need that sort of drive to be able to think, okay, I, I know I'm really busy doing this. I'm producing things, producing products, I'm training, I'm teaching, but there are, there are bigger pictures. You have to plan ahead, don't you? You have to have that sort of that sort of wider vision of what's going on. It's tough being a boss, isn't it? Dear oh, Lord. Um, Grant, we just touched on before about um, that we think young people do want the training. They're, they're open for it. Do, do you find that there's an enthusiasm of people? I, I mean, I've just saying before to Joe, I, I, I trained in inverted commas at Preston Polytechnic in 1979 right, yeah. and I didn't know what was going on I just sort of went through the process and stumbled my way to where we are today mm -hmm. but do you find the your students are sort of an, a, a word of I means to sort of plan a career with an apprenticeship or absolutely yeah absolutely there are no shortage of that applicants and no shortage of talented young people that are really looking for these opportunities and um, I think it's, it's great to be on the panel this morning with, with, with three employers that that really understand apprenticeships clearly and that kind of um, you know view themselves as partners in the process and not just clients uh, for, for training um, because I think that that's what it needs to create those opportunities for, for, for young people mm. um, I mean, you know, it's National Apprenticeship Week. We all know what the benefits of apprenticeships are in terms of productivity and development for staff and morale and kind of loyalty and um, saving on recruitment, et cetera. But there are real financial uh, um, arguments in terms of return on investment. <coughs> um, Department for Business Innovation and Skills a few years ago calculated that for every pound spent on a on a level two apprentice you get a 26 pound return to the business for every level three apprentice you get a 28 pounds return so there's clear kind of return on investment things here so if, if we can work with employer partners that um, understand those benefits that, that view apprenticeships as, as workforce planning um, this this will create the opportunities for, for those talented uh, young people that we've got um, you know, coming to us in, in high numbers. Um, you know, it's interesting to hear Greg's point on the, you know, the kind of trades apprentices and, and, and the kind of intermediate level two apprentices. Those numbers are, are shrinking. There are fewer opportunities for those talented young people. The latest stats show 6% national shrinkage in apprenticeship numbers. But within that, there, there, are, there is a shift to higher and older apprentices rather than the, the level two school leavers. So we need to do something about that to create those opportunities. 
And my, my plea to government would, would be around simplifying the process, introducing those flexibilities Sharon mentioned to make it easier for, for SMEs who, who don't have large back offices and, and HR support systems and finance teams to work with these systems so it can be easier so we can start to increase those numbers for, for those young people. Yeah, well, that's, that's important stuff. Um, Joe, I was just wondering, you're relatively new to the patch. Um, what's, your, what's your take on the region from that sort of point of view, from that sort of skills pipeline? Do you come here thinking this is an exemplar of how it should be done? <laughs> oh, my goodness, there's potential here, but we need to do more. Yeah, I've been making lots of notes, actually. I've been listening to what everybody's been saying, because I think fundamentally we're all on the same page. We've just got to connect the dots a bit better. Yeah. It feels quite siloed. Um, and, you know, we talk about, you know, university isn't for everybody, but actually higher and degree level apprenticeships are a university education. And it's not an either or. Yeah. And, I, and I think we have to be we have to be smarter about helping businesses to understand how they can utilize apprenticeships to have that career pipeline right the way from level two all the way to level six. Um, that, that when they're investing in apprentices at level two and level three, that apprentice can see their career potential career trajectory. And that can be all supported through, through, through uh, the apprenticeship schemes. And I think particularly as the cost of living hits, actually more and more and more people are gonna be tuning into the potential and opportunities that can be at access through higher and degree level apprenticeship routes um, and from a university perspective what we need to do is support businesses to understand how they can work in their business and help them work out how they can develop those but being doing that in partnership with our FE partners is going to be absolutely critical I think I heard about return on investment I heard about productivity I heard about um, 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 that uh, some probably amazing case studies that we have in the region about apprentices that have really done amazing things. I think we need to be much better at that as a region, yeah. really highlighting our success stories, our brilliant apprentices, our brilliant employers that are really, really investing in future talent. I think we need to think about that, how we do that as a region, and actually how we become national leaders in this space. Um, and and I, so I think I think there's this is a great uh, national apprenticeship week is a great week is a great vehicle for starting to raise the the awareness and there's a fantastic platform but I think we need to build on that consistently um, so it, you know lot, lots of work to be done and from 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 a university's perspective the work that's going on in our investments around our new bio industries. Um, 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 investment, the National Horizon Centre, um, our new Net Innovation Centre for Net Zero. You know, this is all stuff that needs to supercharge the skills and awareness of those skills. So then we can support our FE partners in really thinking about those, how we, how we connect the skills value chain, if you like, around, around this piece. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've loved it. I think it, the ambition, the, the, the one, um, the, 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 just the whole environment around the Tees Valley and beyond is really exciting. And, and we know that because of the amount of times we're now asked to feed in at ministerial level around the skills piece. You mm. can see the interest. Yeah, it, it still amazes me that that pipeline, though, as you suggest, still isn't glued together. I mean, we have focuses like apprenticeship, we can like a, events like this, which are so important. But it's, I don't know what the perception of people out here is, but they, whether you're running a business or whether you're involved in apprentices, I don't know whether we want to particularly shout out, but it is the... Well, well, the one thing I forgot to mention, Mike, is what hmm. we want to, as training providers, we, always, we also want to say employees, you're not on your own. And I think the whole thing around an apprenticeship, it's a tripartite, it's a triangulated relationship. And I think that's really important because your employees are not on their own. You know, we as training providers take our role and responsibilities incredibly seriously to support employers achieve great outcomes for their apprentices um, and, and wider workforce. So 
I, th I think that is also really important if any employer is thinking about it, about the support and the partnerships and the help that they get on their journey. Well, I presume that everyone here, I mean, show of hands is really crude, but show of hands, uh, are directly involved with apprentices in some way. So your businesses either take them on or you're interested in them. Again, general view, is it working? Is it a real problem? I mean, you don't need to put anyone on the spot, but we, we think it's working. Is it nods of the head? Generally, nobody's going to say this is a dreadful way of doing things. This isn't the right way forward, which is important. Yes, please. Well, both of you, and I'd always speak to quite similar um, commercial partners around the, the region. The, we're talking about an issue about apprentices and we need to support them with the personnel. The issue we have is from Yeah, Sharon, was, was cost an issue or the, fu the funding of them, a, a, a thing you had to take into account when you decided whether you wanted to do it or not? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've we've always trained apprentices um, because of the nature of our business and our, our location and things. We, we've just done it for, for as long as anyone can remember, really. So we always run at about 10 percent of our business being in apprenticeships at, at any time. Nice. Um and that's the, it's part of our business model that you know we make that commitment. Um, we put an on-site training facility in place in um, late 2019 when I had lots of plans about how 2020 was going to go. Mm -hmm. sure, um, yes. But at least we did it then, and we've got it now to to run with. Um, we've now got a full-time apprenticeship manager, so we've invested in a full-time role mm -hmm. for somebody just to look after that person, which you know for a business of our size is is quite a big thing, but I'm seeing more and more of this, you know, on-site academies, on-site facilities, um, L&D managers. Um, I think that our business models, again, have to adapt to um, the fact that we, you know, we have this skills crisis and we need to address it. And really, if you think about the cost of recruitment, um, you know, you could easily spend perhaps £10,000 per person in terms of recruitment fees, advertising, onboarding, initial training, and all of that kind of thing. So really, if you flip it and think about your, you know, your budget for your training and your retention of your people and, your, you know, your training of apprentices, um, you know, I think it's, it's a lot more long term, as you say, before you get the rewards. But it does for us, it does work. It is valid model. Mm. Mm. What about the apprenticeship levy? What do we as a panel think of the, of the it's a subtle shake of the head for the end of the table? I mean, I, I'm not wasn't sure of the stuff. I made a few notes. It's so. Uh, if your annual pay bill is over three million, you've got to pay the apprenticeship levy charge at 0.5% of the total pay bill. And then large employers can choose to transfer 25% of the levy funds each year to other businesses. Is that a great opportunity? Is that just not structured in the right way? What's the general take? Do you want to lead off on that, Sharon? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's general consensus, consensus amongst all the um, industry bodies that it's been an absolute disaster in terms of it, it hasn't done what it set out to do. It's resulted in a, a real, really significant drop in apprenticeships. Um, the Northeast has been the hardest hit and school leavers have been the hardest hit. Um, so the most popular apprenticeship now in England is a generic team leader qualification. I'm all for upskilling everybody all the way through the business higher level, you know, fulfilling potential with higher level apprenticeships is fantastic. But when we're talking about needing those core skills, you know, those those technical skills that our businesses in the Tees Valley rely upon, it, is, it isn't working. Um, there's been two billion pounds returned to the treasury since it began in 2017. Uh, that's about a quarter of the budget that could have been reinvested. And there's no structure to re, you know, for that to happen. Um, we're a levy payer. You know, any any SME that is particularly high skill, labor intensive business will be a levy payer and have that wage bill. Um, and the, there's no system for that flow down. You know, it's never happened effectively. And, and I d I'm not sure the Treasury w wanted it to happen uh, effectively because they've got two million pounds back, two billion is, pounds back. Sorry. Is it fixable? Then? 
it, it just needs complete reform, Mike, in my view, which is what all, as I say, all industry groups are, and I guess FE groups are calling for very, very clearly, complete right. reform. Yeah. Grant, yeah, nodding, nodding the head. That's a, yeah. It's something that needs a, a big change. Absolutely, completely agree with, with Sharon's points. And, you know, I, I think that two billion pounds when you look at it as, as a as a lost opportunity is is something to be very very sad about really yeah. um, you know and, and to support that I, I think the the, uh, the average uh, proportion of levy use nationally is is 49 percent in companies so there's 51 percent going back so I mean there are um, schemes like the levy transfer scheme which which are to be welcomed and I, and I think there's been some qualified success in some parts of the country in you know, some uh, larger organisations donating levy to, to SMEs. Um, but again, it's very, very, very bureaucratic, mm. isn't it, to, to do that on top of all of the, the rest of the kind of um, bureaucracy that, that goes with running apprenticeships generally. So I, I'd completely agree with Sharon. I, I, I think the whole funding system, the kind of en enrolment requirements um, and the kind of concept of, of the levy all needs to be re-examined so that we can stop this this kind of attrition really of, of, of apprenticeship starts that we're seeing um, and also prevent a wholesale move to uh, levy being used as a, as a kind of CPD um, pot within larger companies to train existing older workers mm. in, in high level skills that arguably could be funded some, some other way um, and try to reroute more of this funding uh, to school leavers and young people who, who need training in, in their work uh, to, to start meaningful careers. I mean, any experience out here about the apprenticeship levy is that that's a general view that it's, a, it's obviously a massive move, a, a massive idea, but it, it is just not, not the right thing to do. Does anybody have any particular take on it at all? I think it's a... Can I just pick up on that? No, I'm, like, of course. Like, I'm aware of the, the, we're all aware of the levy transfer um, but it just needs strip back. It needs it needs someone like like a TVC to, to to hold it centrally, and to say, look, we've got this pot of funding, come and spend it. Do you know what I mean? And, or if if no one grabs a hold of it, then no one knows it's there. So we've we've got to go and searching for it. But then you you, you spend half your day on the computer looking for companies who's gonna gonna give you that funding. But if if it was kept, if it was put in a central pot within the local authority. We could spend it. We could use it that way because we would definitely use it. <laughs> John would definitely use it. Yeah, Carl. This opens up a much wider question about uh, deeper devolution. Yeah, obviously we have the T20 deal, and we're just we're going to have the North East LA7 deal coming up soon. But unless that money and that those powers goes deep enough to be able to control these sorts of budgets, it's still in touch in the edges. Is, is there an opinion about whether devolution should be almost total? or partial, what you're thinking of a business like Active? Um, I would say as a business, don't want to be hypocritical on based on what I've just said about the funding we had before, I don't think we've necessarily felt a direct impact of devolution as a business. We're not linked intrinsically with mm. the, the projects mm. that go on around Teesside, etc. Whether we would have still got the same funding had TVCA not existed, I don't know, because uh, none of us know that. Um, however, I am a fan of devolution in terms of I, th I do think we should be able to make our own decisions locally. I, I don't. Um, it, I, I don't think you would get many Teesiders or certainly Northerners uh, in general saying we want more power up here and, and that transfer of power from from down south. Um, we all stand to benefit. Hopefully, if that comes now, leveling up and Northern Powerhouse and all of these different. Uh, titles that have been banded around over the last five, ten years, uh, it's not the title. Well, I think most people just want to see the action and we actually want to see the delivery now. Mm. So devolution, yes, I'm for it. I think there should be more uh, decisions made here about what is spent here to benefit us. And ultimately, as long as the del delivery starts coming through, I don't think you'll find many people who would be against it. But mm. we're now at that tipping point where We've spoke about them for five, ten years. Things, well, we see it around us, so it, it's happening, but we need to actually see the delivery and the benefit, I think, to, to all of us yeah. uh, is the next stage. Joe, similar sort of point there about 
Teesside University, of course, and having all, if all the funding of all the people you had to deal with and every strand of it was locally held, is that a huge plus? Particularly, obviously, we've got to keep in mind that still the skills side of things, is that a big benefit for being able to control the skills budget more? Um, I, can't, I can't particularly comment on that. But what I can comment on is the connectivity with um, um, sectors, regional partners, uh, and and beyond, whether it's through the Department for Business, whether it's through Innovate UK, whether it's through all these partners, what we need to ensure is that the Tees Valley has the skills that they need to deliver on their capabilities and to enable us to attract inward investment and to attract business. And, and so, you know, I, the organisation I work for is incredibly outward looking and incredibly forward thinking. And you can see that through our campus investments uh, and where we're bringing in international research, where we're bringing in thought leadership. And, and I think you, we, what we're doing is we're focusing on the things that we have control over. Mm. and really focusing on what will make a difference and deliver, not just for the regional economy, but wider, which is why one of the reasons we're, we're launching this week our, our, a new London campus, so we can mm. connect our, our, our researchers, our, our communities nationally. Um, so, so that's kind of where we're at, we're at with it all. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So that's, there's an interesting sort of flow of a flow of sort of thinking that there are things that need fixing you're all obviously doing the, the apprenticeship thing in a really in different ways but absolutely sort of completely embracing it these things need need a bit of a fix though still we go just maybe a little run along the panel about Sharon if there was a, a thing that could happen tomorrow morning and you woke up and you clicked your fingers and regarding apprenticeships and skills it had changed where is it? What is, what's the thing? Is it the levy? Is that still the, is that the big thing? Or? I, I think it's that general flexibility, Mike. I think I think it's just about allowing um, SMEs who know the skills that they want, allowing them to use you know some funding to to develop people in the way that they want to, without being too tied up. Because I think that lack of flexibility. Um, all the different funding streams, the very rigid qualifications. I think that's putting SME, you know, employers off apprenticeships. So I would, I would ask for that. Kind of just say as well, while I've still got the microphone, mm -hmm. we've talked a lot th this morning about all, everything that's wrong. But I, I think apprenticeships are fantastic, and I wouldn't want anybody to think actually it's not even worth bothering. I think that we, you know, we're just all a bit frustrated about the fact that we're doing apprenticeships well despite these restrictions and despite this inflexibility. And we know that everything would just be so much easier if there were those policy changes. But it's absolutely doable. You know, there are absolutely these young people that want to learn these skills and these colleges and universities here to help. So I really would want anybody thinking about it to go ahead and hire apprentices. Yeah. Now, I think that's an important point that this is, we're looking at the positives here. And obviously, mm. you guys are absolutely a, a fine examples of that. We were, we're addressing the challenges and how it could be made even better. But yeah, as a route forward, it's just an astonishingly astonishing leap that people can take into their career. Um, Carl, let's take that same theme about if the, I mean, maybe Active's opinion is that nothing needs fixing, that you're obviously doing sort of really well with it internally. But is there a fix? Is there something in your mind that you think we could do even more if a thing happened? What would you wish for? Well, I was going to say simplification. But that sure. sort of takes a little bit of what um, okay. Sharon's already said. Um, you know, I just as you alluded to as well. You know, we're all running businesses, and therefore, the less time we have to spend trying to sort these things out, the better. So, simplification, accessibility is a is a, is a big one. And then I think the variety of apprenticeship courses would be probably my key thing because mm. again, there might be perceptions that they're only applicable to certain industries, applicable at certain levels. And you know, I think as as more people get on board with them, and they realise that they are open to more people in more roles, certainly we've uh, benefited from that as a business. I think greater variety of the type of courses and the type of skills that can be uh, developed from them would uh, you know would be transformation. Yeah, Grant, it's an interesting point that if young people come to to you 
and your team and say, I, I just want to, I want to do this and this. And it's, can you be that adaptable? Can you tailor it? I mean, that's an interest, the number of people that are coming through ETC. Mm -hmm. And yet, can you treat them individually and direct them personally, or is that possible even? We, we can, and I, and I think, um, you know, colleges generally are very skilled at that, uh, you know, right person, right course, mm -hmm. right qualification. I think our guidance is, is very strong in that respect. Um, when it comes to apprenticeships specifically, though, you know, my, my view is, and it's, it's really, really fundamental, I think, that everyone understands that apprenticeships are jobs that they're, they're not yeah. courses mm. and um, you know it's that partnership with, with business and and yeah. the, the young person or the retraining person and, and the provider and and in order to create those in in the right places and, and be really meaningful there's got to be um, you know support for the kind of you know in infrastructure skills and jobs in, in a place um, and so my, my one thing I think that, that's critical as, as we move forward, along with the simplification and flexibilities, ab absolutely, is, you know, as we move more towards devolution and regionalization and local skills improvement planning, which, which we're doing, and, you know, we're lucky enough to be in a mature combined authority here um, that, that is very much involved in, in that with, with great opportunities, is that apprenticeships are front of shop window within that so that you know with, with our inward investors that we're welcoming to places like Tease Works that that conversations about you know local people integrate apprenticeships and how we support that and, and that we're all thinking about that and we raise the profile of apprenticeships and make them as, as accessible as a training option as possible. Just while you're there you're again relatively new to yeah. the region do you get a good vibe from it from that sort of the future for young people here does it feel it, good it, it's amazing isn't it just to think where we're sitting this morning you know and yeah. I'm, I'm returning back to my home turf I'm, I'm I left uh, you know uh, Teesside a long time ago and I've, I've come back um, and it's a very different place and, and I really think this is a, a pivotal moment for, for the area um, and if the aspirations and hopes that we all have do transpire um, th this this could be you know this could be a boom town couldn't it really and, and it could have fantastic opportunities for, for the people who live and work here yeah we were discussing it earlier on that the my general take on it is is either same thing I'm, I'm again relatively I've been here about 18 19 months now mm -hmm. um, and I came here because of that potential thing as a business writer as someone involved in business yeah. this is the where else would you want to be in the Absolutely. country at the moment Think that it's that same sort of vibe. But what that also gives us, um, getting these skills in place, the important part of this, is it still is a window of opportunity. Yeah. And if we mess it up in some way, if government messes it up, if local government messes it up, if the businesses do, and it doesn't, and maybe it's, it is that pipeline, and if that isn't in place, we kind of, it's going yeah. to be such a terrible shame if, I think we, you know, the success might be nailed on to an extent. But if it, we don't get 100% out of it, if yeah. we just go for 80, 70%, yeah. we will have missed it. Absolutely. It's a big responsibility. J j absolutely, Mike. J just to kind of, uh, you know, think think about that further, that there's a global kind of green mm. subsidy uh, going on, isn't there? A race yeah, yeah. Mm. to fund exactly the kind of thing we're doing here at Teesworks. And you see that happening in America and latterly mm. Europe. If, if we miss the boat uh, with, with that and we, we can't be supported to the degree we need from, uh, from you know, UK PLC, mm. um, that, that is the risk, I think, around this. But, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic about it. I think the opportunity is yeah. there for the taking, but we've got to support this. Yeah, me too. Optimism is high. Um, Greg, let's get back to the, the quick fixes yeah, yeah. or the longer term fixes. What's your real estate? Great, great success at, at Apple Bridge. Yeah, yeah. But it, could it be even more if a, if a certain thing was in place? Definitely, and, and I just want to back uh, Sharon's, um, what she said about apprenticeships, fantastic programs. And we wouldn't have been able to grow the company mm. as we have if it wasn't sure. if it wasn't down to the apprenticeship program. Yeah. Um, and it's always my first choice in, in training. Um, but what I would say is, I would go right back down to the, the, the school leavers in supporting them and what I said earlier in my comments is giving them support around around travel around getting to, to building sites from a construction background give put that support in 
free bus pass, something like that, just yeah. to just to help them mm. get on that first rung as a, as a like what well, granted a, a apprenticeship job. It's not an apprenticeship training; it's a pre apprenticeship job. So, like I say, give them give them that little that little rung up, rung on that ladder yeah. to, to support. It, it's refreshing even to hear the phrasing that you're using there. Their apprenticeships are boosting your business. Mm -hmm. You're not just doing yeah. a decent thing or sort of starting them off. They're actually coming in and making a difference to your business. Yeah, yeah. and like I say, one 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 other thing I would I would like to see improve is is uh, Grant says we we we're not we're not clients we we partners. Try and I'm involved with Teesside, I'm involved with Middlesbrough College, I'm involved with Hartfield College as a partner. Mm. But colleges and universities need need to be more involved with 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 um, with employees, especially when they're doing apprenticeships, um, to support with their, with the, with the training development, and get them in, get employees into colleges and universities to do to do talks yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, Joe, that's such a simple fix, isn't it? Oh. Just get people in and say, this is what this business does. I, These are the opportunities. You know, we can talk about lots of like, you know, really complex governmental things. But actually, what, I, what, I've, I've, um, what I've noticed about Tees Valley is its sheer ambition. And I think we will be judged on how we grow the opportunities for young people, how we see the growth in the region, how we're viewed nationally as enabling young people to develop skills all the way through from level two to level seven. We'll be judged on the growth of our businesses. We'll be judged on, on how, we, how employees talk about the support they get from the training providers. I think that's the key, the, the key thing here. Um, and, and it's very much that going back to that, that partnership approach like you say with greg it's kind of like he rocks up to the office he has a coffee and we talk about how we're going to make things better and that is exactly what we're about no, exactly. yeah. i think that's one thing this panel's brought today is that, that that mix is you're all in a way working with each other you're certainly all working towards the same goal which is to equip your teams with the right sort of skills to equip the region with the right sort of skills but these conversations will be going on and one thing did happen this well, week. UCAS announced that all higher and degre degree level apprenticeships are now going to go through the UCAS machine, which is fantastic because that's a real, a real mechanism for bringing that apprenticeship, higher and degree level apprenticeships into the same, into the same platform as, as normal uh, university um, application process. Okay. So there's massive simplification there, hopefully. So the right steps are being taken, <laughs> hopefully. Um, <laughs> We're just about out of time. Any last questions? Any what, were, what we hope you obviously got today is at least an insight into how the region is dealing with apprentices, how people in all these different sectors are thinking about them, how useful they are. Any last questions? Yes, please. Is that really a question? Just a, a comment, really. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of been listening a lot about um, the issues and the sim simplification that's needed for the system and I just wanted to highlight that um, so I'm, I work for an association of employment and learning providers which ultimately supports um, independent training providers and we've heard a lot about universities and colleges there are a lot of independent training providers out there as well um, but we are one of five partners working with the Education Training Foundation and Department for Education on a new apprenticeship workforce development program so right. it's actually a one, one, to, well, one to three year pro project which may be extended to five years but talking to providers, talking to employer providers, um, trying to bring a lot of this together and we, we are currently in the design phase but if there's anybody that would want to get involved with any focus groups, any interviews just to, to kind of feed into a, an overall report that is going back to DFE in March, um, I can, I've got my cards here if anybody would be interested in and getting in touch and just having a chat really or joining a focus group so i just wanted to highlight that that yeah. work is going on in the background and a lot of what you've said is coming out of that and i think just one quick what one other quick comment that hasn't been mentioned is about additional learning support and how um you know learners that are coming through the apprenticeship system not everybody learns in the same way and what we're finding the feedback from employers and providers is that if that is a bureaucratic system as well in drawing down additional funding and how tutors are trained to deal with the individual needs. Um, so I think that needs some, some consideration as well. Cool. I think those sort of conversations you say, if people want to talk about it, the conversation has to be permanent. It's got to be constantly going on because the situation is changing, the landscape's changing all the time. And what we need out of these things is changing all the time. So I think that conversation has to be absolutely permanent. 
Hi, I'm, cool. I'm here from a, a sixth form uh, college on Darlington. Um, and just to comment, we have increasing numbers of students who are really, really excited and interested and keen for apprenticeships. Um, and one of the challenges that we found is connecting students to opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I, I read something recently that only a third of opportunities are actually advertised on the government find an apprenticeship site um, and, yeah. and, and that is sort of like the, the benchmark go there and see if you can find something um, and it, it is that sort of I think it's communication between everybody and, and yeah. all interested parties um, and I know there was sort of a mention of, of how education can, can and young people can connect better and, and another thing to mention is just the timing of when apprenticeships are made available and I know that businesses have business needs and they go and they seek an apprentice in that moment but when you're stepping off statutory education so as a school leaver you leave college in, in May and that is because that's when your exams are so you are not available to take up a level two apprenticeship mm -hmm. in January um, and if you're an A-level student similarly you can't there are key moments in the academic calendar where you just cannot step onto an apprenticeship unless you've had six months out of education and, and then you miss that sort of the the nice rolling kind of I'm on a, I'm on an up I'm, I'm progressing I'm going on to my next step but you're not because you've got to wait for six months for the next apprenticeship opportunity and, and you de-skill during that time you mm. um, so it, that was just a it's that communication perhaps and the connections between education and the business world that we, we really need to kind of yeah and, yeah and that's easy to do isn't it because we get together in a room and have a nice coffee <laughs> well that's it it is good to do these yeah. sort of things but yeah. also as i said before but it needs to be a much more permanent and regular thing yeah. you need yeah. to be able to reach out to the right sort of people at the right times as you say particularly that's a pipeline from young people to the actual job at the end of it yeah. how does that work timing wise as you suggested and that's why UCAS is so successful. Um, you know, students go off, and, and it's an easy thing to do because it's such a straightforward process. They know where to go. They can see all of the options available to them. Um, and our students have been scaffolded from age of four through an <laughs> education system. And the reality is, they're not ready for the world of work because they don't have those basic skills of right. How do how do I actually go out and find these opportunities? Um, and, and so they do need that little bit of sort of bridging support. It's not, not as intensive as when they're at school, but they do need help. Um, you know, you need to have a CV, you need to have all yeah, of these yeah. things. You need to know about assessment centres. Um, you, you need to know that you're going to do a group task and you're going to be asked to do this kind of thing if you're going to that company. But at this company, yeah. the recruitment process might be completely different. Um, yeah. And there's such a variety of different types of apprenticeships that we need to be able to prepare our students for. Um, yeah. I wonder if in all that conversation, if if the media can play a part in that, in getting these this information together in some way, then yeah, maybe that's something that we, you know. I think it is such a busy landscape. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so busy. <laughs> it's so busy. So I'm um, hopefully this the, the 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 certainly some of the for, certainly for the higher and degree level stuff, actually having it filtering it through UCAS is going to be a bit of a game changer. I'm hopeful certainly for um, for those young people. Yeah. Uh, to keep that word hopeful in there. It's always you just say there's optimism. It's working. Things are going well. We still need to do some work. But let's keep that optimism and that that driving force. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our time. Could I first of all just ask you to show your appreciation for our panel, please?